By 2012, Bungie had stepped away from the franchise they created after releasing their final Halo game, Reach. They were now officially out of the picture. 343 Industries had taken up the mantle of lead developers for Halo, and their first major project was going to be a sequel to the most popular video game of all time, Halo 3. No pressure or anything. The excitement for Halo 4 was through the roof, and expectations could not be higher. 343 decided to capitalize on the hype and went a step further than what had come before. For Halo 3, ODST, and Reach, live action trailers were a big part of the marketing, and everyone loved them. The problem? They were just too damn short. So 343 went about creating a live action film or series. The jury is still out on that. Named after the famous ship that Master Chief and Cortana found themselves stuck on after the climactic ending of Halo 3, Forward Unto Dawn showed audiences the early years of Commander Thomas Lasky's time as a member of the UNSC Marine Corps, helping to flesh out his character, who was set to be a key player in the Halo universe going forward. Well, I, I mean, sort of. He, he was important for one game. That just seems to be a running theme with 343, huh? Look at the cool new character we introduced and then they barely see the light of day after that. I don't want to play with you anymore. At its time of release, and still to this day, reception is somewhat mixed regarding Forward Unto Dawn. So is it actually any good? Has it gotten better with age? How does it compare to the appallingly mid Halo Nightfall and the Paramount Plus TV series that followed? And most importantly, does it suck? Hello there guys, gals, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leigh Paladin, and we're back with another review. FUD, yes, that's what I'm calling it because I genuinely cannot be asked to keep saying Forward Unto Dawn all the time, has been on my list of flicks to revisit for a while now, and a lot of people seemed keen for me to talk about it after the Nightfall review popped off. And a big thank you to everyone who watched that, by the way, it was crazy to see it do as well as it did. So, here we are, Forward Unto Dawn, let's dive in. FUD starts with a really cool opening sequence, showing us the Master Chief in Cryo where we left him after the events of Halo 3. Cortana's distress signal is on repeat, and we start to get the impression that AI rampancy is kicking in. Cortana regains her composure as the FUD, the ship, not the series, comes into contact with Requiem and the Chief begins to wake up from his freezer nap. We cut to the interior of another UNSC ship, focusing on Commander Thomas Lasky in the present day, who has also intercepted Cortana's message. Now, right off the bat, who is this guy? I am not convinced that this is Lasky. There is almost no resemblance to Lasky from the games. They did get Lasky's voice actor, Darren O'Hare, to dub the lines, which leads to some interesting results. Play it again, please. I think they could have just had O'Hare play a live action Lasky too. He looks closer to Tom Green, the actor who plays his younger version, and O'Hare did do the mocap for Lasky in Halo 4. So it's just a bit of an odd creative choice. The mention of Chief's service number, 117, triggers Lasky as he enters a flashback to his younger days as a Marine. Congratulations, you just triggered a Vietnam flashback. Lasky and his Marine colleagues in Astarte squad are tasked with engaging in a firefight immediately after leaving Cryo. One of Lasky's colleagues, Sully notes the bad reaction that he's having to the cryo process. Lasky shrugs it off, regrouping with the Stardi squad who are in the middle of a battle. The group's leader, Vickers, is demanding the team attack the insurrectionist forces head on. Lasky, on the other hand, knows this is dumb and is an easy way to commit unalive. And while good soldiers follow orders, Lasky thinks he knows better. Unfortunately, that goes about as well as you'd expect. He gets shot down, and the whole thing is revealed to be a training simulation. Just like the was that two Star Wars jokes in the space of about 30 seconds? Hell yeah, it was. Back at Corbulo Academy, the cadets of Astarte squad are met at the gates by General Black in a warthog. I mean, they got a warthog in the show. This already feels more like Halo than Nightfall did. Who gives them the whole spiel of insurrectionists bad, UNSC good. As fans of the series, we know what's coming next, but to the uninitiated, it makes for a compelling surprise. And it feels like a, a ticking time bomb. At any moment, those split chin boys and their army of angry midgets could drop in and mess everyone up. Corbulo Academy itself looks 
perfect as well. They've got the fancy looking wind turbines from the first level of Reach, plenty of radar dishes like Standoff from Halo 3, and the architecture is suitably rugged and space age, being believable as a futuristic military training academy. We get to spend some time with the members of Astarte squad, including the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe Lady, who is Lasky's love interest, and they all seem to be very set in their ways, naive, and constantly beat Lasky over the head for stepping out of line, questioning orders, and being a borderline goddamn filthy any sympathizer. Lasky is seen as a bit of a pacifist. I'm a pacifist. You're a thing that babies suck on. No, dude, that's a pedophile. I wonder if Rooster Teeth is going to take the video down for that. It's also established that Lasky has a lot of familial connections in the UNSC with a brother who was an ODST based and a mother who is a high ranking officer. Already in the first what are we up to now, 10, 15 minutes? We're getting a better insight into who Lasky is, his flaws, his morals, as opposed to Lock and Nightfall where we don't know shit about him. The same goes for all of Astarte Squad. Lion Witch Wardrobe Lady Kyla is seen browsing the latest stories of insurrectionists attacking colony worlds, establishing her paranoia and anxiety of what lies outside the academy. Dima is seen playing with a childhood toy which kind of factors into her relationship with her mother who is also a high ranking officer within the UNSC. Sully is is a juvenile delinquent browsing through classified videos of battles that he really shouldn't be seeing. Vickers is doing an upside down push up while listening to a radio announcement of another innie attack. And Lasky is going back through videos of his late brother, the ODST, whose legacy he desperately wants to live up to. After falling in for the night, the squad is awoken with another training exercise to see how quickly they can wake up. Run, 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 run and get their gear on. Again, a Stardy squad falls behind, and this time, the pressure is on. The following day, they are having a major training exercise. A Stardy versus Zuma squad? Did I, did I hear that right? A Stardy versus Zuma. Well, shit, I mean, they've already lost. Zuma squad be out here building sky bases and slide canceling, no cap for real. And if a Stardy fails, well, student debts will be the least of their concerns. Vickers, being the ginger asshole that he is, arcs up and drops a joke about Lasky's bro, which ends with a fight between the two in the mess hall, and oh yeah! This guy gets a cameo too, how fun. The following day, Astarte are versing Zuma squad with Lasky volunteering to lead and things go surprisingly well. Lasky's intuition and knack for out of the box thinking gets them the win and catches the Zuma's lacken until Lasky passes out, his reaction to cryo freeze finally catching up with him. The following day after recovering, Lasky joins the rest of the squad as Sully shows them classified footage of UNSC Marines and insurrectionists fighting together against something else. The footage concluding with a shot of a Spartan, something that the Marines up until this point haven't seen before due to the top secret nature of the Spartan program. Zooming in on the reflection of the Spartan's visor gives us a very vague glimpse of whatever it is they were fighting. Later that evening, Lasky is given the option of a medical discharge due to the severity of his reaction to cryo. He susses out the option with Kyla and he susses her out, if you know what I'm saying, <laughs> which is rudely interrupted by a siren ringing out through the academy. And suddenly, the chips are down and FUD becomes a f***ing horror movie. The cadets are all ordered to the space bridge as the academy is evacuated. So just a quick amendment, uh, Leper Laden and Post here. Whenever I say space bridge, I actually mean space elevator. I've just been watching a lot of Transformers recently, so that wording has kind of slipped into my mind. I apologize. Multiple officers seem to know what's up, but the Marine cadets are all left in the dark, literally and figuratively. ODSTs start dropping onto the academy ground which is never a good sign as they're supposed to drop behind enemy lines as established earlier in the film. ODSTs, exactly. They drop behind enemy lines, attack from the rear. Dima decides to abandon the rest of the team, trying to use her mum's high ranking status to get on board the space bridge early. Though sucks to be her because she's gonna end up as strawberry jam on the pavement real soon. As the wagon full of people goes up the space elevator, the camera looks up to reveal the outline of multiple Covenant Corvettes. They fire at the space bridge, causing it to collapse, and chaos ensues. We get our first proper glimpse at an elite emerging from the smoke and igniting its energy sword as bodies start falling from the broken space bridge above. Hello there. Astarte squad try to regroup back at the barracks to seek refuge and get weapons. Officers and soldiers around them start exploding from needle arounds. It's just pure carnage. 
And it's fucking great. I love seeing this brutal ground level view of a conflict in the Halo universe, similar to what Landfall showed us. Seeing just how fragile ordinary people are in a conflict like this, how outmatched humans are. After getting back to the barracks, the survivors of Astarte squad are hunted by an elite zealot who is using active camo. You can see Chen's glasses fogging up from the breath of the elite before he gets impaled and lifted off the ground in metal. The survivors get to the armory, locking the door behind them and are unable to access the weapons with their codes not working. While Vickers tries to bash his way into the lockers with a fire extinguisher, the elite outside starts to bash its way into the armory. The cadets are forced to hide in a really tense, well-shot sequence where the elite hunts them down. Vickers tries to cause a distraction and just gets taken out right away. Rip to a lad, turns out gingers do have souls. Just as the elite seems to have our heroes cornered, who else rocks up to save the day but our boy, the Master Chief with a knife in the neck. Assassination! Then we get possibly the best line in the film. How did you find us? The distress beacon. Why did you come for us? You're the only survivors. In the school? On the planet. It should also be mentioned that Chief isn't voiced by Steve Downs, which some people find a bit distracting, though apparently the editing crew tried de-aging Downs' voice, making it sound higher pitched, but thought it was too comical. So instead they got actor Alex Puccinelli to voice a younger Chief, still maintaining that gruff pack of Winnie Blue cigarettes a day voice that we all love Downs for, but slightly more youthful. And again, you've got to remember that Chief is supposed to be 15 when this takes place. 15! Chief's body actor Daniel Cudmore is also best known for his role as Colossus in the X-Men series. The guy is 6'6", six six, closer to 6'8", six 6'9", six <laughs> nice, in the armor and built like a brick dunny. He's an absolute specimen of a man. And yet, the best they could get for Chief in the Paramount show was the Shribenator himself, yikes. The Mark IV suit looks incredible too, it's pulled right from the Halo Legends anime. The proportions to me look better than those on the TV series suit. The armor looks thick and heavy, but practical, and a particular addition that I love is that there are no energy shields on the suit. Yeah. Spartans didn't get energy shields till the Mark V armor set, so Chief has to tank most of the enemy shots and pray he doesn't get a Blairmite shard somewhere sensitive. <laughs> Chief punches the locker door, the Marines get their weapons and fight their way out of Corpulo Academy. While Chief goes to scout up ahead, there's a really great moment where Kyla has a bit of a mental breakdown because of what's going on. And I love this scene. It's relatively short, but it's such a realistically human thing to do. The first moment of downtime they get after finding out aliens are real. Most of their friends just died. They almost died. And now they're getting told what to do by a seven foot tall cyborg. Yeah, shit, I'd probably have a mental breakdown as well. Once they make it out of the barracks and into the courtyard, Sully gets wounded by a jackal sniper, definitely playing on easy difficulty because if this was legendary, man's would be dead. Chief runs off to distract the jackals while the marines move to the nearest warthog, even using discarded covenant weapons. Chief hops on the hog's gun, Lasky puts it into gear, and the warthog run commences. Destination? Evac Pelican. Of course, this goes about as well as you'd expect, and some pesky jackals leave a plasma grenade on the road, firing at the Warthog while Chief tries to lay down covering fire with the chain gun. Unfortunately, the hog takes too much damage, and after turning a jackal into roadkill, it breaks down. Chief pumps Sully full of the last of the biofoam so he can at least walk, and Kyla is badly injured in the drive, copping a needle around to the stomach, and she dies. With the Warthog immobilized, Chief tries to hold off the cubbies and bumps into a pair of hunters. After dealing with the first one, Chief Brutally kills all the marines for their ammo so we can kill the second hunter. <laughs> nah, I'm, 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 I'm just kidding. Chief isn't a gamer, alright? He actually asks politely, and Lasky gives Chief his last grenade, which is, you know, it's, it's nice. It's considerate. Be more like Chief from Forward Unto Dawn, people. With their backs up against the wall and barely any time till the evac pelican arrives, Lasky offers to bait the hunter so Chief can get it from behind. I, not like that. I mean, he's gonna plant something in the back of the hunter. I, I'm, I'm just making it worse. Similarly to how the film started, Lasky runs out on his own, distracting the enemy and copping a near miss from a fuel rod cannon as the chief boards the hunter, planting the grenade in its back, blowing it to bits. All the while this is happening, we get a banger of a music track too, with a nice bit of nostalgia thrown in there for good measure. Here I come. Oh, here I come. The evac pelican arrives where we get to see Kelly from Blue Team in... Uh, 
Yeah, that's not the best looking helmet, is it? They just took Cat's air assault armor from all the Reach live action trailers and slapped one of the gunnier knee pads on her face. And once they're on board the Pelican, Kelly and Fred remove their helmets. Some people think their faces are a bit off-putting, but that's the entire point. After spending so much time in their armor, the Spartans are pretty weird and pale looking. Their eyes are really uncanny too, presumably because of the physical augmentations to improve eyesight. With battle and surgical scars on their their face. This is way better than this. They don't just look like ordinary people, which is something that kind of put me off with the Spartans from the TV show. Meanwhile, Chief keeps his helmet on. That is my boy right there. That's the real Master Chief. Chief finally gives Lasky the assurance he needed and we flash forward to the present day. Commander Lasky goes into cryo despite probably still having a terrible reaction to it, ahead of the UNSC Infinity's trip through slip space. And it all ends with Cortana looking at Chief's cryopod as she gets ready to thaw him out, leading directly into the start of Halo 4. Chief answered Lasky's distress beacon, now Lasky is answering Chief's. It adds a lot to his character and explains why he's so willing to go out of his way to help the Chief out during Halo 4 and why he trusts him so much. That's probably why he's the best damn character 343 created, and it pisses me off to no end that he was barely in Infinite asides from some random audio logs. Unironically, Forward Unto Dawn stands out as a solid production, especially when compared to Nightfall and the Paramount Plus show. It's Oscar-worthy, in contrast. The cinematography can be frantic, which leads to moments that are sometimes hard to follow during the action sequences, but it's never dull like Nightfall. It just feels more professional, it's better lit, and the use of slow-mo shots are tastefully done during important moments, albeit maybe a bit too frequent. Are we sure Zack Snyder didn't direct this one? The film does start as a bit of a slow burn. The initial half hour or so may strike some viewers as leaning into teenage drama tropes. The acting has its rough moments, and there are times where it feels like scenes appear to be transitioning from one location to another without a clear purpose, filling time until the plot delves into the more action-packed elements. One commendable aspect of the film is how it subtly drops hints that allude to something more significant looming on the horizon. We receive clues about the Covenant's impending arrival, such as the announcement of a curfew for the cadets, indications of what seemed to be a Covenant dropship touching down on the planet. These subtle touches contribute to building anticipation that makes the Covenant's eventual arrival all the more impactful. Impactful, even if the elite model they used is ugly as fuck. Doesn't make a lot of sense for a Storm Covenant elite zealot from around the time of Halo 4 to be knocking about, but everything else about the scenes that the elite is in more than make up for the inaccuracy in my opinion. Another aspect I genuinely appreciate is the director's thoughtful approach to handling the CGI for the Covenant. Recognising the limitations of their budget, which stood at a modest $10 million, comparable to the budget of Nightfall, mind you, they wisely refrain from showcasing the Jackals or elites in their entirety. When these foes do make an appearance, it's done sparingly and often from a distance shrouded in darkness. Because let's face it, Achieving photorealistic aliens was an ambitious task with such financial constraints. Moreover, the decision to film many of the Covenant encounters at nighttime serves a dual purpose. Not only does it effectively obscure the Covenant, sparing the post-production team from the pain of pouring extensive resources and countless hours into CGI, but it also amplifies their terror-inducing presence. It's kinda hard to make the Covenant terrifying after so many years of fighting them in the games and knowing all their weaknesses, with the exception of, you know, suicide grunts around corners in that one Halo Reach mission and Halo 2 Jackal Snipers, but FUD does a pretty good job of making the Covenant scary. I'm also going to take a moment to swoon over the sound design, which was very tastefully done, using many of the sound effects from previous Halo games. Instead of making brand new sounds, they use the old ones, which are still perfectly serviceable and iconic. The soundtrack was also not bad. Composer Nathan Lanier borrows a lot of themes and ideas from Halo 4's soundtrack by Neil Darvidge, most notably the main melody from Two Galaxy. Now, I can't play you that track from Halo 4 because for whatever reason, Halo 4's soundtrack is so heavily copyrighted that I get nervous just talking about it, but if I even play a short section, the demonetized bots descend on me like flies on shit. Axios is the track that a lot of people point to when talking about FUD's soundtrack, because it is really good. So good in fact that it was used in the Legend of Tarzan trailer, which is a bit of a fever dream to watch. You 
you know, seeing monkeys and stuff jumping through trees and then suddenly the main theme from To Galaxy from Halo 4 kicks in, it's really odd. A few other standouts include Survivors, which plays when Chief and the remainder of Astarte squad are walking through Corbulo Academy after the Coveys wipe the floor with everyone. The final piece on the soundtrack, simply called Forward, also uses little bits of Lasky's theme from Volume 2 of the Halo 4 soundtrack, which is a nice touch. There are some good ambient pieces, a bit of choir thrown in there too, which is a must-have for a Halo soundtrack. So it's no O'Donnell Salvatore, but it's pretty good for what it is. Forward Unto Dawn might just be the last and best translation of Halo into live action, officially at least, and a lot of the good things it did over 10 years ago is what people were criticising the Paramount Plus TV show for not doing. The creators of the Halo TV show could have learnt a lot by watching FUD and using it as a basis for their own stories. Instead of focusing on the Master Chief and Spartans as the main characters, which is a mountainous challenge, seeing as the whole point of Master Chief's character is that he kind of doesn't have a character, they should have focused on Marines or ODSTs, have actual human characters that can grow throughout the course of the series that most of your audience won't get triggered over when they remove their helmets. Keep the Spartans to the sidelines and have them show up rarely. Let the rumours and speculation about these mysterious, genetically modified warriors be a core part of the show instead of outright showing us every little detail of their lives, including their arse cheeks. And Chief is a really tricky character to, to put on film because he's you. You know, you are him most of the time when you play the games and you never see his face and he's enigmatic and he's mysterious and he's like gruff and doesn't say a lot yeah so we knew that if we tried to like bite off too much and explain Chief too much, we wouldn't do him justice because he's always going to be more awesome in your head. You see? This guy gets it. Show the bleak reality of the human covenant war. Have that be the focus of the story and how ordinary people deal with a planetary siege by the covenant being ridiculously outmatched rather than the internal bickering and bureaucracy of the UNSC that no one could give two shits about. And most importantly, keep it within the same universe and timeline as the one from the games. FUD is not perfect. In fact, I probably went easy on it in this review but it is a good example of what Halo can be in live action and how well it translates to that medium when you have writers, a crew, and a director that respect the mythology and the lore of Halo. Going forward, if Halo is going to continue to be adapted for live action, those adaptations should be more like Forward Unto Dawn and less like the boring generic story of Nightfall that could pass as any old B-tier sci-fi flick that just had a Halo skin slapped on it and considerably less of Jimmy Rings and his ring. Thanks.